is going to be talking about uh, implementing Smalltalk on the Rubinius VM um, and uh, how you can learn from that to build your own programming language. Uh, uh, his name is Konstantin Hase. He's from Berlin. He's been in Portland for a while studying, and he recently graduated. Um, and he's going to be going off uh, to get his master's back in Germany. Uh, right now, he's an intern at Engineyard. He is the maintainer of Sinatra. He's on the core team for Rack. And without anything further, I'm giving it over to him. So thank you, Constantine. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about implementing small talk on Robinius. But first, I want to thank Engineer for not only offering me the internship, but also sponsor my trip here and my stay here. So without their support, I wouldn't be able to give this talk to you. So thanks, Engineer. And this has just been covered. I'm Constantine. I'm on GitHub and Twitter, and I have a blog like most people. This is the logo of the place I'm doing my master's at and did my bachelor's at. Um, yeah, I'm on the Sinatra core team. I'm writing a book about Sinatra, so if you're interested in Sinatra, you can pre-order that on Amazon or wherever. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go through that. It's very quick because it has been covered. So, who knows who this guy is? Okay. The rest of you, this is Alan Kay. You should know this guy. Why should you know this guy? Well, just pick one thing, whatever you feel like. Basically, involved in a lot of technology and you're using at the moment, probably. Um, he has already been quoted today. That's his way of predicting the future by, by him inventing it, basically. And <laughs> among other things, uh, he is one of the developers who started the um, small talk programming language, which was the first like, complete object-oriented programming language. Um, somewhat like Ruby, it is nearly completely object-oriented now. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'll show you some small talk in a bit. But why, why would someone want to implement small talk on Rubinius? Well, why would someone create a programming language? Well, why would someone create? Well, this is actually the point where I had this inventing the future quote, but then it was already used in a talk, so I placed in another quote. <laughs> when you don't create things, you come, become defined by your taste rather than ability. Your taste only narrow and exclude people, so create. It was by Why the Lucky Stiff. You probably remember that guy. So, yeah, but why a programming language? Well, here's another LNK quote. I don't like any of them, and I don't think any of them are suitable for the real programming problems of today, whether for systems or for end users. So, I recently heard a talk by LNK where he was talking about problem oriented programming language. The basic idea is systems grow and grow, and you easily have systems with a million lines of code, ten millions of lines of code, and there's just no way you're going to understand all the code in there. So there's really no advantage of it being in one single language. So what if we could keep it smaller, and the developer would have to learn nine languages, but the developer would actually have the chance to understand the system as a whole. For an example, the place where Alan is working at now, Viewpoint Research, they rewrote the Cairo library. Some of you probably heard of it, it's for doing graphics, and uh, mathematic language, and they managed to implement all the Cairo functionality without any exceptions in less than 400 lines of code of that language, as compared to about 120,000 source lines of code. And I think this is pretty impressive. <laughs> so, but to be able to, to do such thing, we actually have to 
be able to implement programming languages. So see this as some kind of extra size. But why small talk? Well, for me personally, I've done uh, a lot of small talk for university. I did my bachelor thesis in small talk. So it felt quite naturally. When I started this project, I was actually implementing Newspeak on, on the JVM. And it is more complicated to implement Newspeak than to implement Smalltalk. And I, since I wanted something to play with, I went for Smalltalk. Well, and why Rubin, yes? Well, in that project, I was targeting the JVM. And it's way more easier, at least for me, to target the Rubin, yes, VM. I love Ruby and uh, the tools supplied by Robinius for generating bytecode and running it are so easy to play with. You'll see that in a bit. So, for those, okay, who in here has used Smalltalk? Oh, that's impressive. Okay, for those who haven't, here's a short primer. This is what um, adding two numbers looks like in Smalltalk. And the lower, the lower version is Ruby, so you can, in case you, in case, in case you don't understand the small talk code, so you can actually compare it. And this is what a chain method calls look like. So to separate the receiver from the method, you actually use a space rather than a, a dot. And this is what a method call with an argument looks like. Uh, you probably know this from, say, Objective-C. And in fact, the Objective-C method calls were inspired by Smalltalk. Um, this is what a method call with two arguments looks like. So, um, the method name for this call is actually convert from to, but the arguments are, um, each are, wo are like woven into that method call which is kind of like keyword arguments. We do that sometimes in Ruby with um, options hash, but it's not quite the same because here the arguments are actually part of the method signature. And this is what it looks like when you create a, a closure in Smalltalk kind of a prog thing. It's what Jose was talking about, the um, having blocks as a first class citizen. And when you pass that to a method, you actually pass it as argument, not as something magic at the end. So interestingly, in Smalltalk you often say do each. This is a common Smalltalk pattern. Whereas in small um, in Ruby you say each do. Each in that case is the name for the argument, which is element down here. And um, Smalltalk is completely object oriented, which means there are no, there's no syntax for doing branching. There's no syntax for doing loops. It is all just method calls. And um, the object true would implement um, the if true method call by just calling the block pass to it. And the object false would implement it by simply not calling the block pass to it. Whereas in Ruby, we use a special structure for that. And um, then Smalltalk has something called cascades, which allows you to send multiple method calls to the same object without having to store it in a local variable. I mentioned that here because I'll show you in a bit how to implement that thing. And Smalltalk is modeled after English, just like Ruby is. Um, it really depends on what you like more. The important thing to see here is that Smalltalk uses a dot to end the line, and you you have to do that. It's not optional in Smalltalk because um, a new line is treated just like space. So um, I started working on this implementation of Smalltalk on Rubinius. I call it Greek. The code is on GitHub. Uh, the name is like Squeak, which is a common Smalltalk implementation, but with an R. And the biggest difference is it's file-based, whereas all the other Smalltalk implementations are image-based. Uh, if you read up on Smalltalk, you'll find out what that is. This is really not what my talk is about. And 
It's running on Rubinius. Everyone loves Rubinius, right? Yes. So, from now on, I'm going to show you some Ruby code. I saw some people complaining about the Go talk and the Smalltalk talk not being about Ruby, so here we go. Um, the Rubinius compiler is written in Ruby. It's extremely modular, extremely flexible, and if you go to the Rubinius repository, you'll actually find the code in lib slash compiler. And what this code does when compiling Ruby is this. It has um, some stages. Each stage taking input and producing output of a different kind. And it's basically the, the structure of every compiler there is. Um, you start with some input, which is either a file or a string. It passes that input into an AST. From that AST generates an in-memory representation of the byte code, encodes that into actual bytes, um, does some packaging, and either writes that to a file or creates a compiled method object, uh, it just keeps in memory and is able to execute. Um, what really is important for us are the parser and the generator stage because that is what we actually want to care about and we want to have uh, Robinius take care of the rest of it. <laughs> so what we do is we need a parser. I went for KPEG. It's a parser by Alan Phoenix, who is also the original creator of Robinius. Um, it's a PEG-based based parser. Um, and why I went for it is because it has a nice, small Ruby interface, which I also can expose in Smalltalk. So I want to write as much as possible in Smalltalk, and I built up the, the grammar in small portions. So this is actual code from, from my project. This up here is the, that's the, um, I, I stole the syntax from new Smalltalk. Um, this is the syntax for method definitions I use at the moment, and it's basically defining the grammar method. Um, and on that grammar method, um, on takes a grammar object, which is used for constructing the grammar, and on that object defines the keyword self. I'll show you some more code how this is actually used. But basically, you have this um, small tag interface for defining grammar, and then down here you also have the Ruby interface for defining grammar. So I can define the grammar I use for bootstrapping in Ruby because I can't define a method without the return symbol, therefore the grammar for returning has to be defined before I can load any small tag code. Um, and then from that, I can generate Robinius bytecode. Um, a nice way to play with Robinius bytecode is to just tell Robinius to uh, compile some, some Ruby code to bytecode and show you the result. Uh, you can do that by the uh, rx compile command if you pass dash b to it. So this is the bytecode for hello world. Now Robinius is a stack based VM. This is the stack down here. It's somewhere in your memory when you're on run Ruby code. And what this code does is it first pushes self onto the stack, and then pushes hello world onto the stack, and sets a flag that allows us to send private methods, since puts is a private method, we need that flag, actually. And then there is the bytecode instruction for sending a method, which will send the method to self, because it's on the stack, with, the, with one argument, which is hello world and then it will place the result of that method call onto the stack. And what we want to do is generate this bytecode. An easy way to generate bytecode is using the dynamic method, method which Rubinius supplies to you. It's kind of like define method if you ever use that, but instead of storing the, the block password for later, it executes it right away, passing a bytecode generator to it, which you can actually used to, well, generate my code. So, um, push self, um, because we want to send the method to, the method puts to self, and then we push the local 
zero, which is the first argument passed through the passed through the method, and then um, when we call self, we tell it that it has one argument and that it may be a private method for, and that way we just implemented the method display, which behaves just like puts. And yeah, we need the bytecode for actually returning because on bytecode level there is no implicit return. Well, but we want to actually reuse as much as possible from the Rubinius by the tool chain. We don't want to go there and implement the bytecode for everything ourselves. I already told you that the Rubinius compiler is rather flexible, so um, since we only want to replace the parser, let's try to, um, we only want to replace the parser because bytecode generation for Ruby happens, the logic for that is kept in the AST nodes. Um, so let's just subclass the, um, the compiler and create our own parser stage. Um, there's actually some magic necessary at the moment. It's going to be removed rather soon. Uh, so you need a bit more code than this. But the basic idea is just um, create your own parser stage. And uh, this is what, uh, in my implementation, an AST node has to look like. It has to implement the grammar method, defining the grammar. Uh, I use bootstrap grammar to ease overriding that grammar. I actually support multiple small dialects, or not yet, but that's the plan. So I have multiple, I, you can define multiple methods for different dialects. And then you have to implement a method generating the bytecode. Well, I'd say we didn't want to, uh, we didn't want to write bytecode if not necessary. So if there is some AST node, which we also have in Ruby, uh, we can just subclass from that one, like this is the one for constant access. If you say object, this is the AST node class used by Rubinius internally. And then just define a grammar on it and use the bytecode Rubinius is using anyways. And the fun thing is that we can even do that in Smalltalk. So true is not necessary for bootstrapping some grammar, so I can actually implement it completely in Smalltalk, and before that file is loaded, you cannot say true, and after it's loaded, you can just say true in the source code, and it will evaluate to the object true. Now, remember cascades? Well, here's some, some demo on how to implement cascades, because since there are no cascades in, in Ruby, we actually have to generate bytecode for them. So, since cascades are really not necessary to implement anything, because you could use a local variable, um, we can define it completely in small talk. Um, the bytecode method gets the bytecode generator object, and it's basically similar to the Hello World example, it has to push cell onto the stack. Or, this is a reverse. simple example, it would actually have to push the receiver onto the stack. And then for every <coughs> method sent in the cascade, it has to um, duplicate the receiver, which is on the stack, so we don't use it. So, um, And then it has to generate the bytecode for the method set, which will remove all the method arguments and the receiver from the stack and place the uh, return value onto the stack. And since we don't want that return value and want to get back to the um, receiver, since we only care about the return value of the last method call, we actually have to remove that value from the stack and then generate the bytecode for the last method. Okay, I hope some of you are still awake, because <laughs> that is it, and I'm open for questions.
down here as one too. Hi, uh, great and interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, how uh, I didn't catch the how how were you able to use small talk uh, in the implementation uh, of new or the generation of new bytecode uh, like from the beginning? Okay, so um, every time every time I create a new AST node class. Um, I regenerate the grammar. So um, you start off with just AST nodes written in Ruby, and at some point you have enough node classes defined that you can parse a subset of Smalltalk. And once I reach that point, I'm able to create new subclasses from Smalltalk, and then after the code, like. After this code has been executed, um, the, the grammar will be regenerated, including this um, grammar definition. This grammar definition will automatically be associated with uh, this class created with the subclass statement. And once, and I add that to primary values down here, like uh, any literal is the primary value or any local variable is a primary value. And once it finds true somewhere in the source code that is passed from then on, it will create a new instance of this true literal. And then when it is compiled, it would actually call the bytecode method um, defined on that literal, which we don't have to define because we inherit from the true literal that ships with Rubinius. So we'll just create the bytecode that is used for true and Ruby. Did that answer your question? Okay. There was one more down here. Good question down here. Great talk, by the way. Uh, one of the things that reminds me of is kind of the cross-language possibilities of the JVM. Um, and I was wondering if um, you've kind of used it to run Ruby code and Smalltalk code side-by-side, uh, -side, or if you know of uh, any other languages that have been implemented using Rubinius as well. Um, there are a few languages uh, implemented using Rubinius. I think the most complete one is um, Fancy implemented by Christopher sitting right there, two rows behind you. So that is fairly usable. There are there are beginning implementations of common languages like Python or JavaScript or CoffeeScript, but none of them, including my small talk implementation, are at the point where you could really use them to run real applications. Um, yeah. The main advantage is that if you like Ruby and if you use Ruby, then it's probably easier to target the Ruby sphere than to target the JVM. Even though uh, Charles Snyder would probably disagree right now. So you mentioned that there was a little more code that you had to do to get things to work, which makes sense. Uh, how well documented was this whole process? Uh, was that little bit of code that you did essentially glossed over, or the Rubinius developers targeting this use case? Um, both. So uh, the Rubinius developers are targeting this use case. It's not high priority. Uh, what I had to do is, at the moment, override um, the new method on stage. Um, but one of the things that will happen probably rather soon, like next in the next week or two, um, uh, as part of this internship, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, that I will with Brian for work on the stages and make them more flexible for exactly that use case. So. Well, I mean, it's more of a, an abstract, like, how easy is it to just 
get in there and jump into the trenches? Do you have to do weeks of figuring things out, or is it relatively? No, it's, it's really easy. So awesome. Um, the the stages thing is actually even uh, even documented. Lots of lot, lot of stuff of the compilers not that well documented, but I think Yehuda wrote the documentation of the compiler stages, making it pretty easy to get a grasp of what they are for and what's going on. Okay. 